Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you also for the, the organizers, to the to the organizers for organizing this nice um, conference and um, and for you know continuing the tradition. So uh, as as I was mentioning on Monday, so we are trying to make it happen also next year again. So if anyone wants to help, I know that uh, Gianmaria already volunteered and also Antonio Ortiz. So we might so might need someone else, and uh, if we can uh, do something about gender balance, will also be nice. So so if anyone is interested, just uh, drop me on the chat or whatever. Okay, so so today I'll talk about this uh, viscoelasticity of topologically active polymers. So we heard a lot about uh, um, active um, materials in general, active matter during this week. What I want to present today is an activity that is not. Uh, um, uh, to push uh, particles or polymers somewhere, so it's not for translational motion, but it's for uh, changing of topology. And, uh, and, and let me make this a little bit more um, um, precise or, or in the context. So let's think about a bit how we make polymers. The way how we make polymers is that, or material made of materials made of polymers, as Tom was saying. So we have a, a synthetic, uh, let's say that we have a synthetic polymer, we synthesize the polymer, either we put it in concentrated conditions, so in concentrated solutions to make something that uh, is viscoelastic, or like oil, shampoo, these kind of things, or we glue them together to make uh, things that exist stress, like plastics or vulcanized rubber, like for tires. But then this is uh, so when we want to break it down, it's uh, it's a quite expensive process because we have to apply chemical or uh, mechanical, um, quite a lot of mechanical or, uh, or chemical energy in order to break down these polymers down into individual monomers. This is what we typically do, and obviously this is a very inefficient process because then we all know the consequences of this that we have a lot of you know plastic that is now recycled. But let let's think for a second how nature makes probably arguably the most important polymer that there is, which is DNA. So this is a representation of the organization of DNA inside the inside our human nucleus. And it's a mess. So, so there is a lot of DNA inside the human nucleus. But still, when the cell divides, so the, and this is probably the most important point of the talk, is that when the cell divides, it never degrades DNA down to base pairs. This would be a very bad, mis bad mistake because obviously you lose the genetic information and it will be impossible to stitch it back, right? So, so basically there is a problem here. There is a topological problem. So you have to divide two meters of DNA in two daughter cells without breaking the DNA down to, down to monomers. So how do you solve that? And nature has, uh, the, the way the nature, nature solves this is by having some proteins that change the topology of DNA. And in particular, I'm talking about this protein called the topoisomerase, which acts as a little scissor and a little glue at the same time on, on DNA. So what topoisomerase does is that every time it finds an entanglement between two DNA chains, it uh, creates a little break, expands a, a little bit of energy, uh, one ATP, to uh, bind, breaks, uh, breaks one of the two DNA strands, passes one through the other, and then joins it back. And, uh, and basically, this is a topological activity in the sense that it uses energy to change the topology of the DNA. Okay? And so and this is a very efficient process which, and a local process, which then affects the topology on a global scale in the sense that the, the genome can replicate and can divide into two daughter cells without creating any problems. And so my point uh, is, uh, uh, can we use this kind of technology to create new materials that could be useful for us? Okay? And basically, this is what I'm going to explore in the next uh, five years. So in, uh, in more, uh, let's say, let me generalize this a little bit more. So there are many, many, well, man, many, just one many classes of proteins that change the topology or mechanics of, uh, of DNA in, vi in vivo. So for instance, topoisomerase I just talked about, and there is restriction enzymes or recombinases or SMCs. So these are, uh, we heard the talk earlier in the week, there are um, uh, proteins that can make loops out of DNA. And so the state of the art is that uh, basically molecular biologists are very interested in these proteins and because, for instance, they, they want to mutate them and see how the cell responds, if it is fine or if it is, uh, if it is not fine. Uh, in vitro, most of many people do it at a single molecule level. So they take one piece of DNA and they look at, at the single protein on a single piece of DNA, what happens. But then what I want to do is something a little bit different in the sense that I want to reverse engineer uh, this approach and use, the, use all these classes of proteins to instead make topological complex fluid. In some, and in some sense, what I'm trying to investigate is whether molecular biology plus polymer physics plus topology is a sort of a new form of, active, of uh, soft matter.
Now, in this talk, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of uh, of things that we're gonna we're gonna do. So so this is all you know. This is a in theme with a with a with a with a workshop that is challenges rather than results. And I'm gonna give you just a little example with some results towards the end. So the first example is uh, what is so no is known as a kinetoplast. Probably you you've heard about this or maybe not. So this is the genome of a parasite. is a parasite is called trypanosome that causes sleeping sickness and leishmaniasis. So if you look at the mitochondrion of this parasite and you slice it, you take it out, you see that the genome is not like a normal genome, but is a genome made of uh, thousands of sm very small DNA rings all linked together in a form of a percolating network. And uh, and the the Obviously, you can start asking questions of how the hell it happened that, that an organism makes such a genome. Or you can also uh, see that from a material science point of view and saying, oh, but this is, a, this is basically what, what's a, a, an Olympic hydrogel. Right? And so this is actually a, this is a, a, a picture from a paper of a couple of years ago from a Stanford group, uh, uh, Spakovitz, Spakovitz group in Stanford, where they used uh, some DNA plasmids in uh, uh, large concentrations and they added topoisomerase 2. And they were able to see that the that the bulk will become el elastic, but they, they but at that point they don't have any control of what is the topology of the network, and so and so this is something that we, we we want to explore a little bit more. And actually, recently we have some uh, 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 so people have have, have looked at the topology well of the, the equilibrium properties of the conformations of this. Um, um, of, of this kinetoplast in, uh, in imaging. So you, it turns out that you can buy this kinetoplast from company. And so Alex Klotz from uh, the MIT, in MIT uh, with uh, Patrick Doyle, they, they just, you know, they put it under a microscope and as you can see, it forms this very beautiful sheet. You can, this is a sheet of linked ring, of DNA rings. And what you can, the most striking feature is that it, it almost looks like a shower cap or a crochet hat. Chris would say, uh, basically it's uh, it's it's not flat. So the perimeter is shorter than what you expect for a disk of the same area, and basically buckles. And so what we what we are trying to do also in the lab here is uh, so we bought also our own kinetoplast and we're starting to play with it and and we were able to see this nice uh, this nice shapes. Um, and uh, and let me share with you this this one because I'm quite excited about this. We were um, so this was last week. We were playing around in the lab. And what we did was to uh, make a little electrophoretic cell in which, um, so I'll stop this because it's a bit confusing. So we, we put two, two metal wires and we were able to apply some voltage inside a little microscopic uh, chamber. And we were able to uh, basically sh shoot the kinetoplast out of, out of the window in some sense. And so now we're gonna try, uh, try to play this game and uh, make it uh, pass through, for instance, porous materials like, high, like uh, uh, um, agarose gels and these kind of things to see how it stretches, for instance. So this is one uh, little project. And another, uh, something else that we are um, interested in is uh, uh, to take inspiration uh, from our recombinase alter genome topology, alter genome topology to make uh, new materials, for instance. So typically recombinase is, is, a, is a protein that is involved when you want to shuffle uh, genetic materials, so in mitosis, in, uh, sorry, meiosis, or uh, for instance, when phages invade the bacteria. And um, here, what we what we were doing is some some preliminary molecular si dynamic simulations in which we confine a bunch of rings and we uh, we start doing some reconnections and see at the end what we get. And what we were uh, seeing is that depending on the stiffness of the DNA inside, you could see uh, basically a bunch of unlinked rings, a small unlinked ring, unlinked rings, or a bunch of uh, very long and all linked rings. So you can control the topology this way. And uh, we are trying to do this in the lab as well. So this is our first attempt of um, putting DNA in vesicles. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and so this is yellow stuff uh, moving is uh, DNA in vesicles. And then the idea is to have some protein in there that, which, um, which modifies the, the topology of the DNA inside these vesicles and see how, what you get uh, downstream, let's say. Um, let me give you another, well, I'll probably very, go very quickly through this one. So we heard about this loop extruding uh, motors uh, earlier this week. So basically these are motors that jump on DNA, on DNA and they extrude loops. And so this is obviously, it's, an, it's, a, it, it con, it's a motor, so it consumes energy to do that. And um, what you could think is that because it extrudes loops, so you could drive a transition between a, a, a linear chain 
And if you have many of these motors, basically this chain will become a sort of a bottle brush, a bottle brush polymer. We, we, we call in polymer physics this thing. And so by having a bunch of these motors, if you add, the, if you add them in a, in a system, on a, in a melt of linear chains or linear DNA, you can drive a transition between a melt of linear chains and a melt of bottle brush chains and, and back and forth, depending on the ATP or the concentration of these proteins. And so this is a fun game that we're going to play uh, hopefully soon. I'll, uh, okay, so let me jump into uh, the example that I wanted to give you uh, with a couple of results. So I wanted to start very simple. So the, the, the system that I talked to you about are quite complicated. I want to start a little bit simpler. And so I started uh, playing around with the restric restriction enzymes. These are enzymes that have been evolved by bacteria to defend themselves against viruses. So here is a picture of a phage virus, lambda phage virus attacking E. coli. So what happens is that the phage virus will inject its uh, DNA inside the bacterium and the bacterium wants to defend itself. So it has engineered or evolved these uh, uh, restriction enzymes, which will chop the DNA, the invading DNA. And uh, typically restriction enzymes nowadays are used for cloning. Uh, and, uh, and so they are heavily engineered. You can buy them very easily. And so a question, a question that I want to ask is, what happens for entangled DNA? So if I if I get DNA in, in an entangled, so uh, a, a large piece of DNA like a lambda DNA, which is pretty long, it's 50 kilobase per long, entangled, can the restriction enzyme chop that DNA? And what happens to the viscoelasticity of that fluid? So first thing that we did was this uh, so-called gel electrophoresis experiment, in which what you can see is that uh, uh, these bands correspond to DNA fluorescently labeled, and so we, you run the gel, uh, you run the DNA through the gel. And uh, uh, bands at the bottom have a, a sh a shorter pieces of DNA and bands at the top have a larger piece of DNA. So as time passes, what happens is that you have a one big band, one band with the, all the big DNA. And then as, as, time, as time goes on, you form these uh, bands at the lower, with lower molecular mass. Um, and so basically you, are, basically you have this enzyme that is chopping up DNA as, as you think it is. Right. So this is just uh, just a visualization of what is happening. But what what is happening to the viscoelasticity? So what happens to the viscoelasticity is basically you can you can understand this in in, in terms of reputation theory. And uh, thanks to Tom, actually, I don't have to go too much through it. Basically, you have an entangled system of uh, of chains. You can imagine that the surrounding chains to any one chain is forming a sort of tube. And then this test chain is kind of rotating rotating back and forth until it has relaxed its, its stress. But now, with the addition of restriction enzyme, then uh, on top of the reptation, you also have an architectural change, right? And in particular, for the digestion, for the restriction enzyme, you have, a, you have a, an architectural change that only breaks the DNA. It, it, it never fuses the DNA back with, a, with, a, with another piece of DNA. That would be another operation. And so let me uh, uh, try to sketch a little bit of theory. So the problem of uh, the reputation on a tube, you can be mapped to a, basically a system of a 1D, a random walk in 1D with uh, absorbing boundary conditions. And with a, with a, with a dynamics, with a, dynam with a diffusion coefficient that depends on the length of this domain. And so if you do a little bit of math, what you get is, uh, is, is a relaxation time for this object, well, for many of these objects, for L of these objects, uh, the scales as the length of this domain cube. And you can understand that because each of these L segments, they have to perform diffusion, which is L squared, which takes you to a, a time scale that is L squared. And then you have L segments that perform L squared. And therefore, L cube is the longest diffusion time of, of this object. Uh, and uh, But for li leaving polymers, for, for polymers that change shape, uh, you can basically, def you can come up with a theory. That this was my case in 1987 who basically uh, said, OK, so if we introduce some rates that break, that shorten this domain or make it longer, then we can come up with a theory, we'll go through the details, in which the, the relaxation time scale is actually the geometric mean between the, the larger time, largest time scale, which is this L cube, and tau b, which is the um, time in between a break and a fusion event. And this is an equilibrium. So basically, the probability of having a break or having a fusion is the same. Okay. Now, what I did was to push this uh, to out of equilibrium in the sense that I can, instead of considering 
breaks and fusions, I can only consider breaks for restriction enzymes and fusion for different types of enzymes. So let's have a look only at the breaks. So if I only do breakages, then at a certain time after this, they add my enzyme, the relevant time scale is the original size of the polymer divided by how many breaks, how many breakages I've introduced at a certain time. And so this is basically an evolving time scale, which becomes shorter and shorter in time. And there is this parameter chi, which is basically this, the number of breaks that you introduce at, for, a cert, for, a, for a given relaxation, for a one relaxation time scale. And so again, if you do a little bit of algebra, it's not particularly difficult. You get the, the, the uh, time scale tau of relaxation of the chain, which then gives you the viscosity of the, of the system. It's basically it's this tau td, tau d, divided by this quantity cube here. Okay. And for uh, uh, fusion only, instead, if I don't have any breakages by only fusion, what happens is that you get an exponential increase in time scales or viscosity. So you can do some simulations, and uh, not surprisingly, you get what you expect for. So these dashed lines are the theory, and then the, the points are 1D simulations that I just showed you before. So you have random walk that goes left or right, and the domain and the boundaries, the absorbing boundaries are kind of are moving either shortening or elongating in the case of, of uh, fusions. Um, but what we, what we really want to do is an experiment. So we, we bought in some lambda DNA uh, and it comes already at quite concentrated conditions. So it's already almost entangled and then some restriction enzyme. And so what you do is, well, you first have to actually to buy a little pieces of DNA, which quench the, uh, the overhangs in lambda DNA, because otherwise you get concatenations. So you have to quench those single stranded uh, overhangs at the end. And then we also bought in some polystyrene beads to perform what is called the microreology. So you include the, the beads inside the, your entangled system of DNA. Okay. And then you, you add the restriction enzyme at a certain time and you start the timer. At that point, you are in an equilibrium and you're basically driving the system to a new state. You fill in a capillary very quickly because you, you want to be quick. And then you start recording movies of the particles jiggling. So on the right hand side here, this is water. This is, these are the particles in water. On the left hand side here is the particles on the, on the lambda DNA, an entangled lambda DNA. And what you can see here is a little bit drift, which you can, you can get rid of. But basically what you should appreciate is that the dynamics is completely different. And so what you measure is the, is the mean square displacement of these beads as a function of time. And for different, lag, uh, for different aging times from when you start adding the enzyme. So uh, at, as a control, you see that there is a subdiffusive regime here and then becomes diffusive. So this is the mean square space on the beads. But after three hours that the enzyme has acted, you don't have any subdiffusive behavior anymore. And it's completely, uh, it's completely straight, right? So it's a completely freely diffusive system. So what you can extract from here is the viscosity, simply one of the things. So you can also extract a G prime, G double prime, but you, and a simple thing that you can extract is the viscosity simply by looking at the large time behavior here. So this is simply Stokes Einstein equation. So the diffusion coefficient of these objects are related to the size of these objects and the viscosity of the fluid. And, and uh, so here, so basically you get a viscosity as a function of how much time has passed from when you, you added the restriction enzyme. So if you normalize by the initial viscosity that you measure, uh, this should be what you expect. So um, because basically I skipped over this, it's, I should have said, but basically the, the relaxation time scale is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid uh, through, a, through a coefficient, basically. Um, and so what, when we do experiments, even with different uh, uh, restriction enzymes, so we use different restriction enzymes. So this, the black curve is the theory, what, you, what we expect from the theory that I showed you before. And the points are what we measure with different restriction enzymes. And we can also do with same restriction enzyme, but different uh, concentrations. And if you rescale time appropriately using this coefficient chi here, uh, you can collapse these curves together which is uh, so suggesting some kind of universal behavior that doesn't depend on the enzyme they use. And this can be, for instance, used as a predictive tool for uh, DNA-based uh, uh, materials that are being digested with restriction enzymes. So uh, I'll go, uh, this is basically my last slide. I, I wanted just to conclude with a piece of trivia, which might be interesting. You, it, uh, when, it, when I tell this story to molecular biologists, they're always, sometimes they don't know this. So it's, it's, it, when, you tell, when you tell something that they don't know to a molecular biologist, it's kind of, because I'm a physicist, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's quite nice. So, 
maybe you maybe you'll find this interesting as well so when i was doing these experiments uh, for me i mean it was quite simple it was quite easy to do uh, obvious to do these experiments so mu someone must have done it before this is what i thought and then i was reading a review on restriction enzymes and what i discovered that there were these two guys in 1970 that they won the nobel prize in medicine exactly by doing this experiment and uh, so what they did was basically they, they took some DNA from a, a, a bacteriophage, so P22 bacteriophage, and they mixed it with the lysate, with with lysate of a bacterium, Haemophilus influenzae. And they, they put the mix, the mix together, so DNA of a virus and the inside of the, of, of, of the, of the bacterium, and they put it in an Ostwald vis viscometer. And what they measured is the change of viscosity of that solution over time. Okay, and what they saw is that if uh, is that they saw that the viscosity w was changing, was decreasing over time, and from this they concluded that inside the bacterium must have been a, a, a restriction enzyme, something that was chopping the DNA of the virus, and they called that HIND2, which is the first ever discovered uh, restriction enzyme. And so one day I decided to take their data and plot it uh, in a log log scale and try to put my my predictive my my equation, and uh, I'm sorry. I always forget that I have this joke down here, which is, says that I'm only 50 years behind. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then after this, uh, yeah. So I so I plot it in log log scale, and then it falls perfectly on the on the on the one over whatever cube there is is there. So, um, uh, yeah, I was yeah, it was pretty nice to see that 50 years later, you know, it's still 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 valid. Anyway. So this is it. Um, summary. So the genome is an active material, topologically active material as well. Um, uh, solutions of DNA and proteins have in interesting, interesting viscoelastic behaviors that are relevant for biological function, but also potentially leading to new materials. Microbiology is very useful, I think, and digestion by restriction enzymes appears to be universal, so it doesn't depend on the particular enzyme that you use, and it's uh, valid 50 years later as well uh, from experiments. And, um, and some other project that we are looking at is the rheology of DNA origami. Uh, uh, microbiology of supercoil DNA. This is actually uh, in collaboration with Jan, and this is in press. Actually, this work here. Um, uh, some, yeah, the kinetoplast DNA I, I talked about a little bit, recombinase, loop extrusion, etc., and and also gels of DNA nanostars with proteins. And this is also something that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, thanks to you for the attention and to to all of these people and those who pay the bills as well. I guess. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, do we have any questions for Davida? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, David, for the beautiful talk. Um, I am. Uh, I was very happy to see it again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry that you asked. No, me. no, no. I, it, I, I mean, it, it is a very, very beautiful things you're doing. Um, I was wondering uh, when you mentioned the, um, uh, the SMC proteins, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of, uh, kind of uh, glared through like a part of your slide where you were you mentioned networks. Yeah. My question would be: You would think that so this uh, uh, this protein would also kind of connect different chains that's what you are seeing there yeah don't tell anyone though it's uh well, it, it's for uh, so I, it, this is a hunch but uh, i well it's i don't know so i think that in entangled the solution so labo key stacker they saw that the this this thing does loop extrusion mm -hmm. for intra chain but if you put many chains together like in entangled state I don't, I don't, if it is, if the mechanism of loop extrusion is not topological, so if it's not embracing the DNA, then it might be the chance that there is actually a tran, an interchain linking at that point that will look exactly like a slip link. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, hopefully, I mean, no one has seen it yet, but this is basically a conjecture and we want to test mm -hmm. it. Because it would be very different from having exactly exactly this is this is the whole brush. point exactly this is a point one point if so if you drive a transition to a bottle brush or you drive a transition to a slip link you have completely two completely different rheological response to the addition of SMC and so you could discover whether it is an intrachain effect or an interchain mm -hmm. effect. Thank you. Okay, uh, so there's a question from Jan next. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I had a question to the last to the very last 
slide about you being 50 years behind. And the question is whether these guys have actually discovered this uh, power law that you showed there. This one, no, no. Uh, because it was about the time when people sort of started already to understand the uh, reputation and stuff. So I know, but these were uh, people that work in uh, in a, I know, like, I know, but in a know. hospital. So really, yeah, don't, yeah. yeah. The polymer physicists haven't looked at it at that time, right? Exactly, exactly. They, I don't but think they never spoke. That, that you are not fifty years behind. <laughs> Because well, you explain I mean, the observation that is 50 years old, but it is. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, so then a question from uh, Damien. Yeah, hi. Well, <clears throat> it's not really a question, it's more a, a comment or a, <laughs> something I wanted to share. Yeah. From the Good. very beginning, so really from the starting point, because for me, all that stuff is completely new. Yeah, th that slide here, when. When you mentioned that you have this enzyme that is cutting the DNA and then uh, removing, let's say, the loop yeah. to make it easier to disentangle, yeah. um, I'm surprised that it actually works. Because I mean, in, <laughs> in, in the sense that you're saying, yeah, you, you cannot degenerate DNA, right? Because you are losing yeah. uh, the genetic information. Yeah. But then you know you have a you have I mean all these processes are, are at the micro scale where you have a lot of noise, uh, yes. and I'm very surprised that you yes. can achieve that. Yes. At such a high precision, yes. considering all the thermodynamic bounds that you might uh, absolutely, encounter. absolutely. So let me let me say that the that the fun, this is still a mystery also for microbiologists how exactly it works. So the, so they know the structure of topoisomerase, but they don't know how exactly it works. So the mechanism of through which this happens in such a nice precision is a mystery. Also, um, and this is perhaps this is not known a lot. If you use in vitro. In vitro, if you put a little bit of topoisomerase on an ensemble of DNA, you remove knots. But if you put a lot of it, it's the best way to create knots. Mm. So basically, what my what what we are what we are saying is so, and this is something that I worked on a little bit a couple of years ago, is that there are is not topoisomerase alone that removes knot in vivo, but you also need to have some other protein that helps it. And actually loop extrusion would be the perfect one to help because by loop extruding a polymer with a, a ring with a knot, you localize the knot. It's like uh, you pass it through a carabiner, you make, it, you make it tight, and then topoisomerase at that point is very efficient at removing the knot, for instance. So, uh, so basically, by by having this synergy between topoisomerase and other proteins, uh, you make you make this process very very efficient, also in simulations. So it explains it pretty well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So whilst whilst you're on this slide, maybe I can ask a very quick question. So you yeah. said that the, this topoisomerase, uh, so to to cut and repair, it uses an it uses one ATP. Um, two ATPs in two total. But are there so are there top are, are there similar top high summaries which can do this without using ATP? So the uh, ones so the they there is there are top isomerase which do not use ATP which break only one of the two and allow the swiveling. So it's topo topo one. So it allows the swiveling of the two and does not use ATP, but it doesn't remove knots. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay, so then I think we have uh, maybe time for one last question uh, from Anton. Yeah. Hi, I, I also had a question about this slide, which is new to me. So you made this contrast between how rubber right, has to be degraded and uh, uh, topological activity. Is there a sense that topological activity is somehow cheaper than if you made a, you know, a, you know, a, an entangled polymer melt, it would be easier to degrade? That, that, that is a very interesting thing that uh, I Let's say that I want to believe, but I don't. Have, <laughs> I, I don't. I, I cannot give you numbers for this. But uh, mm -hmm. for instance, if you think about okay, think about the case of the kinetoplast. So for the case of the kinetoplast, if you want to unlink, so if you want to reproduce this network, if you want to degrade this network, you don't have to degrade single monomers of the polymers that make the network. You just have to remove the the, the link. So if you use one ATP, let's say they use one ATP to break down one piece of DNA, uh, then it's a, and you have the rings that are, are uh, n bits long. You actually need only you you only need as many as it, as, it, as many ATP as many as there are rings in the network, not uh, base pairs in the network. So if, does it make sense? So I think for this, for instance, it could be yes. So the monomers become the rings themselves, not the base pairs of the of the DNA. And also the monomers of the polymers, let's say. 
Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, exactly. Be, uh, it would be interesting to, I guess, it, for rubber, you need uh, as many you know, that there. Its elasticity depends on the number of cross links, right? Exactly. So, exactly. So it probably scales somehow differently, right? And, exactly. So this is a very good point. So understanding how the elasticity scales with the with the topology of the network, I don't think that has been done a lot, and this is what we want to do. Indeed. Yes. Exactly. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Thank you.